Welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atto Kwesen, and I am a professor of English at Stanford University. This episode will be used to illustrate a form of spatial analysis through the concept of the chronotope, using the airport as a central example. The term chronotope comes from two words in Greek and simply means space-time. It was adopted by the Russian theorist Mikhail Bakhtin to explain the ways in which spatial and temporal indices came together in an expressive unity as a key aspect of the European novel. He deployed the term chronotope as a way to demarcate certain generic conventions in narrative fiction. Thus, he argued, for example, that the chronotope of the road raises distinctive implications that are quite different from those for the parlor, the castle, or the small town. Even though the chronotope is typically used as a device mainly in literary criticism, I want here to explore its implications for both literary and real-world spatial analyses. I also want to augment Bakhtin's description of chronotopes by adding some further definitional nuance and also some examples from our own contemporary experience. To start with, I want to add that a chronotope must be imagined as having an entrance and an exit along with the spatial and temporal markers that help define it. Thus, a sports stadium is a chronotope while the Queen of England is not. She is simply a person that also acts as a symbol of other things. I shall explain this definitionally augmented concept of chronotope specifically with respect to the airport, which I hope to show is a chronotope of disaggregation. A chronotope of disaggregation is a space in which people are not encouraged to remain, but is designed for them to pass through and be redistributed elsewhere. This contrasts the airport chronotope to that of, say, the cafe or the marketplace, which are both chronotopes of aggregation. Given that space is not simply a container, but rather a symptom and producer of social relations, we will also explore how chronotopes such as those of the airport also allow us to understand different aspects of human social interaction. As Mikhail Bakhtin puts it in Forms of Time and the Chronotope in the novel, a literary work's artistic unity in relationship to an actual reality is defined by its chronotope. Therefore, the chronotope in a work always contains within it an evaluating aspect that can be isolated from the whole artistic chronotope only in abstract analysis. We cannot but be strongly impressed by the representational importance of the chronotope. Time becomes, in effect, palpable and visible the chronotope makes narrative events concrete, makes them take on flesh, causes blood to flow in their events. An event can be communicated. It becomes information. One can give precise data on the place and time of its occurrence. It is precisely the chronotope that provides the ground essential for the showing forth of the representability 
of events. For Bakhtin, the chronotope discloses the relationship between the world represented within the novel and the world outside. This implies that the chronotope is a form of cognitive apparatus and also a schematic organizing principle of narrative. Bakhtin's definition privileges realist fiction as opposed to, say, science fiction and fantasy. However, there are also ways of reading chronotopes in non-realist genres so that they deliver viewpoints on mundane reality outside their textual domains. Within the chronotope, time is materialized and space is temporalized. Furthermore, as Bakhtin continues to explain, chronotopes in the novel are also fundamentally devices for staging encounters between human actors. The examples that Bakhtin gives us of chronotopes in his essay include those of the road, the castle, the provincial village or town, the parlor, and the threshold. However, the manner in which he explains the collocation of their mutually reinforcing temporal and spatial indices also suggests that the configuration of space and time differs according to which chronotope is in question. For example, according to how Bakhtin describes it, the chronotope of the road is typically a device for displaying the range of social heterogeneity. In all literary examples where the road chronotope is dominant, the central character tends to interact with a wide range of social types as he or she undertakes their journey. The chronotope of the, of the road then helps to define a spectrum of society. Examples of the root chronotope and its various cognates, such as the journey, the sea voyage, and so on, can be found in many places, such as in Homer's The Odyssey, Hervantes' Don Quixote, and in countless novels and movies throughout world literature. Geoffrey Chaucer uses the road chronotope in the Canterbury Tales to display a wide spectrum of social types in 14th century England as they embark on a pilgrimage from the Tabard Inn in Southwark to Canterbury Cathedral to visit the relics of St. Thomas Becket buried there. Chaucer's general prologue to the Canterbury Tales acts as an introduction to different colorful characters and personalities, such as the wife of Bath, the knight, the clerk, the miller, the monk, and various others, with details as to their attire, the way they speak, and even their personal idiosyncrasies amply illustrated for us. Their descriptions then act as a preamble to the various stories that they tell to entertain themselves as they proceed on the road to Canterbury. Yet each pilgrim's story is also a window into various social, class, and gender interests and anxieties in the period. The point to note, however, is that in its simplest form, the road chronotope tends to establish time in the form of a chronological sequence tied to the traversal of space. Contrastively, the castle chronotope displays a sense of antiquity or ancientness that is lodged firmly within 
its architectural and spatial features. But the castle also implies a sense of strict hierarchy, especially for those who happen to be new arrivals to its social forms. It is not unusual also for novels that feature castles to also bear a sense of the repression of unsavory secrets, such as we find in Gothic novels that feature castles, like Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto and Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and Bram Stoker's Dracula, among many others. In real-life castles, such as those on the coast of Ghana in West Africa, the unsavory secret pertains to the transatlantic slave trade, so that the castles then act, act as living monuments to a brutal past. The parlor chron chronotope, on the other hand, is a space that can only be entered through selective invitation. And Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, the parlor chronotope is securely tied to social balls and parties, but in such a way as to compress the sub-aristocracy and the ruling classes and their concerns into the space of the parlor. It is not unusual also for the parlor in literature to represent a space of social gossip, political intrigue, and even treachery so that every conversation in the parlor points towards something else of significance beyond it. In modern literature, the drinking bar or pub takes the place of the parlor, and its effect is also to alter the character of the social and class relationships displayed within it. Strictly speaking, however, if we are going to deploy chronotopes for use both for literary criticism and for the analysis of real life spaces, then we have to incorporate a few more features to it for greater analytic suppleness. And so I want to suggest that A, we see chronotopes minimally as spaces whose dimensions include entrances and exits, and B, that they be classed into chronotopes of aggregation and chronotopes of disaggregation. Bakhtin does mention in his account that the image of man is inherently chronotopic, but I think that serious problems will likely arise with this idea when we try to identify the configuration of temporal and spatial indices through which to think of the figure of man as a chronotope. A man is very different spatially than a road, a castle, or a parlor, unless we stretch the analogy into complete vagueness. And so, like Bakhtin, I propose to set the image of man outside the realm of chronotopes. Chronotopes of aggregation are those that encourage people to remain within the space for as long as possible through a variety of mechanisms. While chronotopes of disaggregation are spaces in which people pass through and are redistributed or dispersed according to certain rules and regulations. Thus, a cafe, restaurant, or mall would qualify as chronotopes of aggregation, while airports, railway stations, and bus terminals provide instances of chronotopes of disaggregation. Some chronotopes have dual functions, or at least incorporate features of contrasting spatiotemporal indices into a single unit. And so a university is, for example, essentially 
a chronotope of aggregation that nonetheless also accommodates certain spaces and rhythms of disaggregation. This is especially so with universities at which most of the students are required to reside on campus. Undergraduates arrive at a certain time of year, have to obey residential requirements as part of their participation in scholarly activities, and yet have this essentially aggregative quality regularly punctuated by both school and public holidays. Special interests such as chess clubs, black student associations, fencing clubs, and dance clubs, among others, also lead to different forms of internal aggregations, while termly or annual examinations institute a gateway effect to the aggregative character of the university. This is because they are also the means by which students are validated to pass to the next stage of their studies. The end of year or end of program rituals of graduation then demarcate the end point of aggregation for the university, after which everyone is supposed to disperse back to their homes until the next academic year when the cycle of aggregation is inaugurated all over again. Thus, a university is a multi-rhythmic chronotope that establishes specific structural, spatial, and temporal relations between students and their residences, dining halls, classrooms, sports facilities, and instructor's offices, while also being punctuated by certain known and predictable rhythms of disaggregation. And so we come to the airport, which I think is extraordinarily fertile as a source for thinking about chronotopes of aggregation. My comments here pertain to travelers and not to those that work at the airport itself, since for them, their experience of the space will be quite different from those of the traveler. My comments are also especially pertinent to large international airports, such as London's Heathrow, Toronto's Pearson, Paris's Charles de Gaulle, Atlanta's Hartsfield Jackson, Singapore's Changi, and Accra's Kotoka Airport, among various others I'm familiar with. What I'm going to describe can also be seen in smaller airports, but the fine details that are going to be laid out are much more evident in the larger ones. The first thing to note about the airport is that strictly speaking, as a traveler, you have not quite entered the airport or indeed arrived at it until you've gone through security and are on the other side, as it were. In her essay titled, Welcome to Windows 2.0, Motion Aesthetics at the Airport, media scholar Julian Fuller calls the airport a perceptual machine. While its perceptual status is initiated in full force once we pass through security, it is the relationship between the perceptual apparatuses of the airport and its spatial temporal indices that make the airport such a fertile site for thinking about the concept of chronotope. Once you cross airport security, you are governed by a completely different set of rules from those that operated on the outside. Not only have you surrendered your freedom to behave as you wish, you have also submitted yourself to certain strict regulations of space and time. 
One of the more ubiquitous and readily noticeable aspects of airports is the many wayfaring signs pointing you to gates, to stairs and elevators, and to eating places, bathrooms, and other facilities that abound and keep being repeated throughout the airport. The reason for the proliferation of wayfaring signs is to make it impossible, or at least very hard, for you to get lost at the airport. This, of course, does happen from time to time. But the point is that you can be set on the correct path very quickly and with a minimum of fuss. The second thing that is most noticeable about the airport is the degree to which you are constantly reminded of time. Time indices are to be seen not only in the many clocks that seem to proliferate everywhere inside of the airport, but also through the regular and repeated announcements of departing and arriving flights. In this sense, there is no real airport without the insistent and persistent repetition of time. The announcement of flight schedules is normally taken for granted by travelers until, that is, something goes wrong with your flight and it is either delayed or canceled. After that, the announcements of departures and arrivals act as a way to remind you that your time is really not your own and that you must apply all due diligence to leave the premises, either toward your destination, if you're lucky, or back home, if you're not. Another point of the persistent reminders of time at the airport is also to let you know, even if subliminally, that you are now subject to a fresh set of temporal codes. Your private temporal rhythm has now to be synchronized to that of the airport and your entire consciousness adjusted accordingly. Because it is an airport, the temporal reminders appear to be objective and non-idiosyncratic, unless, of course, you find yourself being fed doubtful stories of why your own flight has been delayed or cancelled. As a passenger, you then feel that your airline, if not the airport from which you are flying, is essentially capricious and not to be trusted. But there is one more feature of the airport chronotope that requires particular attention. And that is that even though it is primarily one of disaggregation, the airport also incorporates in itself a secondary chronotope of aggregation expressed materially in the form of the duty-free shop. The duty-free shop imports into the space of the airport the features of a completely different chronotopic infrastructure, namely that of the commercial mall. In contrast to the airport, the mall is a chronotope of aggregation. Everything about the mall is designed for you to remain in there as long as possible so that you can be relieved of your money. The mannequins in the shop windows are there to entice you to not just look at the clothes they wear, but also to steal a quick glance at yourself in the glass, with the ultimate objective being to entice you into the shop so you can hopefully spend some money. The logic of the mall is essentially that of slow time. Many malls now have live entertainment or play areas for children or even cinemas and sometimes even uh, bands and various buskers to ensure 
that customers have an all-round enjoyable leisurely shopping experience. In North America, it is not unknown for malls to be attractive places for teenagers who often go there in groups just to hang out for hours and hours. The airport duty-free shop carries some of the mall's function, except that it too is regulated by the dominant temporality of the airport that we discussed earlier. The thing to note, however, is that despite the fact that the airport and the duty-free shop represent completely different chronotopic features, they are both united in inducing capitalist consumption. In other words, a traveler is conceived of as a capitalist subject most effectively when traveling through an airport, because it is then that the objective of getting someplace else to visit family and friends or simply for vacation is firmly coupled to the impulse to spend on gifts, tokens, souvenirs, or simply on items of self-care. Thus, the impulse of expenditure is amplicated for by the duty-free shop for the traveler. The airport is ultimately a place of consumption and not of contemplation. And like, for example, the library or the theater, which furnish us with different chronotopic arrangements altogether. In fact, we may even argue that airports are the very last places where one can adopt a contemplative mood because the level of anxiety and alertness that is required to survive properly inside an airport is simply not conducive to any kind of contemplation. Because of the nature of the spatial and temporal indices that organize airports, the nature of social interactions within them are also of a particular kind. Unless you are traveling with your own family, the serendipitous relationships that you strike up at the airport are likely to be constrained by the oppressive nature of waiting enjoined by the space or a sense of emergency if you are running late. It does not help that now everyone is likely to have an electronic device to which their eyes are glued. And this does not make the possibility of even eye contact uh, possible. Social interactions tend to be shallow and cursory and are liable to be interrupted re repeatedly by the need to listen out for departure and arrival information. This feature of social relations is endemic to all chronotopes of disaggregation such as railway stations, bus terminals, and subways, where again, the pressure to get somewhere else as fast as and efficiently as possible uh, interferes with the ways in which you interact with others. Airports have been favored sites of representation in literature and film for a very long time. As Christopher Schaberg illustrates in his book, The Textual Life of Airports, the airport is saturated with scripts of all kinds, sometimes concentrated in the airport bookstore, but often also displayed as a matter of course on different surfaces at the airport. It is also a place for the expression of specific performative scripts. And he writes uh, eloquently of the different performances that converge around 
the points of screening at the airport, both on first entry through security and right before embarking onto the plane itself. We may add, however, that the textual life of, of airports is not much different from those of large railway stations, where there is also a necessary proliferation of texts. But the airport is distinctive as a chronotope because of the ways in which space and time are configured within it, making it perhaps the most intense chronotope that we have in our contemporary experience. Next week, we'll be looking at the concept of spatial traversal in relation to trains and railway station, as represented in the movies The Born Ultimatum and in the Netflix series Arsene Lupin, a recent gentlemanly crime thriller set in Paris. Thank you very much. Please remember to check the reading suggestions in the episode description below. And if you like this episode, remember to give a thumbs up, subscribe and share, hit the notifications bell so that you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.